All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you one of the inventors of the Lucia Number no. Three, dear friend, an amazing heart-centered individual who is bringing light in so many different ways in the world. Um, please welcome Dr. Dirk Prockel. Thank you for being here with us. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. And hello to all the light attendants who are joining us. Yeah. Uh, my talk, uh, I plan to make it about some personal aspect of working with light, not just to to talk about uh, technology. Um, and yeah, it's well about uh, the approach, why to make something with the light when you can have a direct access to all the possibilities and you're in inner light anyways. So uh, yeah, uh, Engelbert has already talked about, um, well, just a message from Michael, <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, uh, has talked about the near-death experience and that was a starting point. Um, that, and just uh, yesterday I wrote, uh, read about an article uh, and it was about the not NDE. Uh, that I would say it's the near-death experience without being near a death situation. And uh, it makes the difference between the defined situation and uh, uh, the experience. And the light is all about to give an experience, not to talk about uh, some hypotheses or theories about it, uh, it's the easiest way uh, for me to share this one light experience. And there are many approaches to that, like uh, also taking psychedelics. Uh, the people report uh, similar experiences, like the people who were at the rim, at the border to death. And also, people with mystical experiences had uh, had some, uh, yeah, similar uh, experiences. You can have it by means of meditation. You can also use the outer world according to the principle as inside, so outside, as above, so below. And uh, it's just to show the light in a form by means of a lamp uh, so that any person can experience this igniting of the spark that we have in us. And that's always there. And we just don't look at it. And we don't have to go on search for something. It's always there and all the time, and not only in us, also in the outer world. And uh, it's, uh, it makes no difference which way we go. We are linked to this uh, source of energy, of love, of being together. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I took an approach going from that side, from the physical world, just to uh, give some stimulation in the natural pathway of the visual system, the neurological system, and uh, also saw that it spread it out through the nerves and the body, also the sympathetic or vegetative uh, nervous system with a vagus nerve that also has some impact on some experiences. So it gets well in line with the kind of, uh, would say, psychosomatics of the brain itself. And bringing together these different aspects of psyche and uh, soma, the physis. Uh, that's 
what what brought me to to my both studies uh, psychology and medicine and specializing on neurology and coming back to psychology again after that time but neurology helped me a lot to be part of the development of this lamp so i use it uh, primarily uh, in my practice the talks with my clients uh, usually come very soon to those experiences like near-death experience like psychedelic experience ego dissolution letting it go from the concepts of your own and of the world that's always linked in a very tight form that we don't reflect but it gives us some chance to play with it play with our brains and play with our psyches and by this uh, yeah have fun as an approach to the bigger one and uh, well using it in my practice i have the clients and i had many talks beforehand and so uh, i have no certain procedure in my my clinic but as I'm going out of this uh, institutionalized uh, healing scenery with chamber of physicians and so on, uh, I'm looking also uh, to other arrangements of presenting the light. So going more to hmm, would rather say events i don't like the term workshop <laughs> i don't like to work uh, i like to be active but not working and so I, I use it in the most cases in the form of microdosing uh, taking the structure that Heidi Mann has spoken about so i i do it with the clients as soon as i think that it could be beneficial for them i speak about the light and then i see how it goes on uh, the next uh, sessions and uh, usually when i'm doing the microdosing with light it's really a microdosing and some people also appreciate the combination with the uh, more pharmaceutical or natural uh, biological approach of psychedelics so uh, it's well in line and i do it for five to three uh, uh, four to five weeks and um, then uh, twice a week first the initial session then twice a week and I speak with the people in between and also of course when they come with the light for the light and uh, yeah so it goes on and it has a kind of yeah succession in it so yeah. Peter, you're saying you're working with um people with microdosing so you what kind of uh, issues or why do they come to you to begin with? Like what's happening for uh, that usually? Oh, very different reasons they come for because uh, they come for different reasons into my uh, neurological practice. And uh, then I have to see whom it, it could help. And it's most the contact between the person and me if it's okay, I can think about going such a pathway. And uh, then it comes up that there could be a relationship with the issues they come for. And that could be, you know, I've heard it uh, in the other talk, it could be burnout syndrome. It would be inter very interesting to see some follow up of studies in this field because most people who come with burnout syndrome have so much success going back to their source and experience their worth they have in themselves, not in their work or what they have to do or the situation. 
and also mm. people with uh, migraine, migraine. Um, then I come very often to a point where we can see that there are more the psychic associations between uh, uh, the headaches and the person. Uh, so it's uh, very soon a talk about their situation in life. And I also had some um, uh, very abruptly coming uh, releases of psychic energy and coming also to critical points where I had to be in the close uh, contact with the people and yeah, once I also needed the help of the hospital because I, I was away. So that's the reason why I do it in blocks nowadays. And I know I'm there and can uh, uh, yeah, deal with the situations. Also, hmm, pain, people with pain, generalized pain, uh, usually, I, uh, otherwise they are too much focused on the pain, the region of the pain. And so I s stood away from um, uh, working with the pain in the shoulder, for example. But some people have an undefinable pain in the whole body. People after dank fever or bor borreliosis or similar conditions and uh, also with uh, recurrence of other viral diseases. And so it's more about helping them to deal with the situation than to take away the pain. It gets lighter, but they feel there is, they can sense it, there is some pain, but they can say, okay, it's there, it's not me. Uh, so this effect of dissociation that uh, Schwartzman at the University of Sussex worked on. Yeah, so a broad range of applications. And uh, I wouldn't say if someone doesn't come for a special purpose, then it's easier than if they are just curious whether it could help. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. And some experiences with uh, people with epilepsy or other kinds of uh, convulsions um, with a photosensitive epilepsy. I made the experience after the two minutes uh, session, they uh, blocked it. They instantaneously said, oh, no, no, that's too much for me. So we didn't uh, complete the two minute sessions and nothing happened. And other people, yeah, once I had a woman and she made some sessions, uh, she didn't want to make them again because it was very intense for her. Uh, and it was in the very beginning of using the lamb. So, um, but she had no epileptic seizures for one year afterwards. And she had them uh, up to twice a week before but uh, yeah as it goes and other people with epilepsy just wanted to try where there is a, a threshold and wanted to get close and i think it would be possible to de develop it but it should be in a clinical uh, arrangement maybe in a study and i i wouldn't recommend it so it's always a uh, a matter of connectedness, whether I do it. It's not about a special disease, no. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's about if they feel, you feel safe with each other to go into this place, right? Exactly. And so uh, all the methods that you can combine with the lamb or the rituals that you can have or ceremonies, uh, what kind, whatever, uh, I'm going more to, to, to some aspects of the Celtic world at the moment uh, from Europe, 
So uh, uh, I think it can help the people to go into this experience and it holds the space for them to know there is a ritual. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And what about people with uh, dementia, early dementia, full on dementia? Have you worked with them personally uh, when someone, Christine, is asking? And if so, um, was there any reversal or stop of the progression? Um, yes, I, I've made some sessions in a care, caring home and with older people, not only demented people, but older people. And the experience was very beneficial. Uh, after a while, we had to stop it. It was too much that we had to do. I did it with Engbert. And uh, so it was uh, too complicated, but it would be worthwhile to go further with it. So one woman, she, she usually didn't speak anymore when she was in this home. And after the session, the next day, uh, when she never spoke and just ate the, her dishes, uh, not dishes, food. And the next day, for the first time, she looked at the caring sister. May I have a soup, please? The first time uh, she, she brought out a wish that she had. And many were activated. Uh, it's an issue with demented people because uh, they are more inclined to have epileptic seizures. So also this question would be one for research work in the clinical field, I would say. Uh, uh, as it is about first getting older, uh, it helps people to be more activated and they feel the fun and the joy again, the openness going away from thinking about death or illness. And so it, it's very helpful in this way. And maybe it's also the contact, but I don't want to differentiate because light attendants are always there with their own personality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everyone is so different, right? And again, that's a reminder for everyone listening that we're all so different. Um, and actually, yeah. one one question on that, um, I think I know your answer, but someone was asking if you have done any experiments with neurofeedback and Lucia, such as modulating um, based on the brain waves of the light, changing kind of frequencies mm -hmm. or settings. Or maybe you can mm -hmm. speak to your breathing belt and biofeedback a little bit. Well, I, I began with uh, doing some EEG with the clients because I was just curious to know whether something happens in the brain waves. And on the full screen, it was not easy to see. But after a while, uh, taking the frequency analysis program, I could see uh, a phenomenon that's called building up of harmonics in the brain. We have uh, photic driving effects. So if you give, for example, uh, nine hertz uh, stimuli, the at least occipital pole of the brain uh, goes into the nine hertz activity, even if it's at 12 hertz or so beforehand. And uh, after a while I could see that the people who watched it uh, very open-minded and uh, could go into deeper clinical, deeper stages of consciousness, uh, they developed these harmonics. And that's uh, uh, an activity of the brain where you uh, the brain is confronted with a frequency and the visual field, uh, it not only uh, reacts to it like a passive uh, gray matter, uh, it starts to build up own, its own activity. And it happens at a point where 
where you can also observe these harmonics coming up. And these are frequencies that are generated in higher ranges or maybe sometimes in lower ranges uh, of the frequency band of the brain. It's between delta, sub-delta and gamma. And uh, that's a phenomenon that did not occur. I did it twice with uh, people. My son was one of them. Uh, when they were falling asleep during a session, being very tired and, oh, do I have to make another experiment with you? <laughs> uh, and then I couldn't see the harmonics coming up. So it's not just to, to put something on the brain, frequencies, uh, chemicals or something. It's uh, the to ev evoke some original brain activity and it's nice to see the frequencies emerging in the EEG and after a while yeah uh, it was that I told uh, about uh, the bidirectional neurofeedback it was a term just to describe uh, the experience of the lamp or the light the flickering light constant light um, usually you have to visual, uh, look at a screen to get the information about what's happening in your body, the biological uh, parameters, and the feedback occurs on the screen or by loudspeakers. There are many approaches, and then you can see what happens in your body. But with the brain, you can close your eyes. You don't have to watch any screen. You have the screen in your mind and look at that. And then you can see what's going on in you, in your brain. You don't have to go outside. You will know it by your own. And so that was the point of uh, neurofeedback. And well, I did some experiments with measuring also the galvanic skin response and combined it with uh, a breathing belt to give a feedback via the lamp uh, about your breathing rhythm. You have experienced it, Alison. <laughs> and it just came to the point uh, of, you know, giving the feedback of the spontaneous breathing and not by manipulating the light to induce something, but bring the people to watch how they breathe and dive deep into this feeling. Yeah, it's beautifully yeah. put. Yeah. And so, you know, for everyone listening, there's this really strong tendency for us to try to treat things, to try to fix things, to try to focus on specific frequencies and get something from it, to do something to our brain, right? But this is all ego. Underneath it, as Dirk so beautifully spoke about in the beginning of the talk, the sense of love and oneness that's always there is always there. We just need just returning to that. So the light sessions are more of invitations to return to that space rather than trying to use very specific frequencies or procedures or anything like that in order to control the brain. So, and I love how you said, it's not a, you know, it's not a brain entrainment device at all. It's a invitation and that initial photic driving can encourage one brainwave to join, right? And then right. it's allowing, if you're awake enough, if you're in the right state, that it's allowing your brain to kind of take over. And then it's less important what the frequency is and more about yeah. how much you let go into the experience and allow your brain to, you know, come into those harmonics. So beautiful. Yeah. And taking the brain, it's the same as psyche and as the, these contra, uh, contradictory terms, psyche and brain, uh, that have to come together.
the vibe got too high. Um, we're frozen here. Hopefully Dirk will be back in a moment. Um, does this happen to anyone else out there in the chat or sometimes the frequency gets so high that you actually start cutting out um, the video? <laughs> okay, we lost Dirk for a second there. I'm sure he'll be coming back in a moment um but yeah and so yeah i see evan you know also asking about frequency ranges of light have reproducible effects it's not about having chaotic effects um everything i've learned from dirk is more about um again moving from this idea of trying to look at really specific responses from specific frequencies right and so there's a way that that can start the process but when we get into trying to find studies to analyze what one frequency does to the brain you're never gonna have a good answer because a lot of it is about every person having a very unique brain and less about trying to get a specific response it's more about harmonizing coherence coming back to your wholeness instead of trying to again control move change you know um find something reproducible and as as deb said so beautifully before you know in the beginning it can be really frustrating because you just want a puzzle pieces you know to come together you really want to be told the a plus b equals c but the more you work with the lucia the more you open to the fact that it's less about you know control of your brain and more about opening into this beautiful space and looks like dirk is coming back here wonderful um he's coming back while well, he gets Settled. You have to unmute yourself, Dirk. Well, as you get settled, I'll explain. So the breathing belt was this incredible um, tool that Dirk created so that you could actually, as you breathe, the light intensity would change. And so that was a way to start, you know, tuning into your own breath and how your breath actually influences your reality, right? Because as you're breathing, the light was really changing. I found it amazing um, and really inspiring because, you know, breath is the number one way into our nervous system, which is a real regulator of how we are. And so by mm. have, attaching the light to the breathing belt, wow, it was, it was really cool. And yes, it's breathing belt. So do you want to share any more about the breathing belt, Dirk? Uh, it's a technical device uh, to register the excursions of your thorax. When you breathe in, it widens, and when you breathe out, it uh, compresses. And the belt has a piezoelectrical uh, part in it, so if there is uh, some pressure or tearing on this crystal, it produces electrical uh, signals and um yeah so uh, these can be transformed to to changing the light yes <laughs> yeah so awesome yeah maybe someday someday we can get one that um to you know to share with people that they want to practice with mm -hmm. it i found it really yeah. really beautiful but we'll see um great and so Um, okay, I'm just looking through the questions here. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to, Christine, I'm going to take one of your questions and um, shift it slightly, but how do you think your perception of the Lucia has changed since the development and how has the Lucia changed you in the process of working with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it happened over the time, so it's not easy to say whether it was Lucia or uh, other experiences of the situations. It's all at once. <laughs> and so, yeah, indeed, uh, my experiences with Lucia didn't change so much. I, I go into these experiences, mostly I ex just enjoy the colors, the structures, and sometimes some phenomena 
as the point uh, which some people have also reported about when a new light comes up and it's a bright crystal white light first in the periphery of your visual, visual field and now it might sound crazy i made some personal experiments with this uh, upcoming light and tried to catch it to focus it and it vanished all the time until i just uh, mentally focused on it and then it came nearer and then afterwards it seemed as if everything everything it was shining on everything and it everything took over this crystal clear white light and yeah there, there are some yeah interesting experiences also with uh, yeah low doses and so on could help to to make some excursions some research work on your own and it's <laughs> very interesting my my life has completely changed uh not always for the best but i i'm thinking about maybe it's good it helps me it helps me to take a step into working more with the light because my traditional uh, work as a physician of the chamber with all the restrictions and uh, the control measurements you have to agree with uh, general health politics so i decided to step out of this system and well it's not about making a marketing with health uh, the right people will come just for the experience and they can take the, uh, the health issues uh, you know, as a side way side effect <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, what's really exciting? Well, actually, on that topic with the microdoses, someone was asking which type of um, psychedelic do you prefer working with microdoses? And what kind of dosing do you enjoy working with? Um, well, I have everyone should uh, look at the local legal. Uh, regulations so it's not possible everywhere to do it so just from this perspective more yeah uh, okay i i would prefer uh, or i prefer uh, mushrooms they are also growing here on the mountains um i like uh, the lsd and also uh, a low dose of changa dmt and mdmt in the pipe but only low dose and stretching the experience under the light and just taking another token and <laughs> stop again and uh, that's also what uh, if people who come into the practice practice and say they uh, uh, do the microdosing at the same time. Uh, so uh, usually uh, it's the people who take the mushrooms. It's easier to 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 argue about it. It's regional, it's local, it comes from nature. The people can go out and pick them <laughs> and use them. And uh, so, uh, it's very convenient, but all the three uh, substances I mentioned, they they are very interesting. And with the microdosing, it's good. First, you can approach it in a very moderate way. And uh, I have some clients who are not in the age anymore, like me, uh, just going out and uh, getting some uh, substances so it's good to have a natural way 
and uh, it's easier for them to to step into all these experiences but first they have to do the light experiences in the isolated form and they have to know what's about psychedelic substances and i know their medical history of course Beautiful. Great. And then Deb is asking, uh, what would you feel is the most important thing you've learned or awareness you have had since the last Congress that you would love to share with people holding space for the Lucia Light, light guides or attendants? Uh, the last Congress in Innsbruck. Um, yeah. At the moment, I'm on developing uh, in cooperation with others I'm uh, trying to develop a, a ritual for our actual times and for the present times so not uh, completely taking old um, surface of rituals but uh, using the principles behind uh, I combine it, of course, with uh, some incense. I combine it with, uh, with talking with the people. And I combine it with um, yeah, some nice um, paintings or tapestry, small tapestry. And uh, yeah, it's more the situation to come together and that's holding the space. That's almost all that I do at present and developing the ritual because it's also nice to come together and like sitting at the fire and, <laughs> and sitting at the Lucia light. That's the same. <laughs> so beautiful. And could you define for us um, in your talk, you said something the title was Psycho Neuro Magic. Um, <laughs> can you explain that a little bit? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, maybe it was because of the uh, recent story about this virus going around uh, of the last three years. And uh, the topic of neurobio. A social model of the people or the neuroimmunology. Uh, that's a part of medical psychology to investigate the interdependency of your psychic state and uh, the state of your immune system. And so it's very important to keep away from chronic stress and anxiety, for, for example. And there's a lot of anxiety at the moment in Europe, at least. And uh, so this, um, uh, oh, that was at the anxiety. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it has a suppressing impact on your uh, immune system. You can measure it. And so it means uh, presenting joy, fun, this ah experience to the people that should help the, uh, the to, to boost your immune system. That's the link between neurology, and the biology. And as I said, uh, the whole story working with the light is uh, it's a mystical tour anyway. So <laughs> didn't expect that to happen, but uh, it's uh, for me, it's a very individual too, but at the same time, if uh, we can say as inside, so outside, sometimes I have the impression there's coming a big wave over humanity. 
and uh, uh, big change is awaiting us as humanity. And by this happening, each one of us has his personal approach to it and personal link to it. And so it's, if we have good experiences in our sessions, if it happens, it's wonderful. We can see it's going on also outside. And it's just the first glimpse into our future. So beautiful, yes, the wave of awakening. Ah, great. Okay, well, we have just a few minutes left here and we have a couple last questions, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, Deb and different people are saying just their gratitude and that they hope you stay connected to us and our <sighs> community. So okay. we'll keep, keep the conversation going with Dirk. Um, and Evan was wondering, sure. what do your neurology colleagues say about the lamp? And how often do you do sessions yourself? Uh, well, uh, I myself do sessions very seldom. It can be weeks up to months that I don't do any session and uh, I don't miss them. Just uh, a few months ago during the lockdown and I was also very down at that time. Uh, uh, who is it in Australia, mm, her name, well, the light attendant uh, in Australia, she, she was also at the conference. Nancy? She told me I should make a sense. Nancy, yeah, Nancy Becor, ah, thank you. Um, she told me uh, I should make a session myself. I did one and it helped me a lot. <laughs> So I also have to be reminded of the power of it. Uh, and at the same time, I know uh, I have this from the beginning on, I have this feeling that there's uh, some kind of work or something to be done still waiting for me and uh, like being on a mm, mystical mission. In, in this world and so yeah I, I, I'm uh, waiting what's going on and so there's no no pressure about it to to make more sessions I'm just um I try to keep my track perfect beautiful yeah I appreciate that and then for the the last question someone was just asking you know have you connected with other um, neurologists about this? Um... Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, if, if they are interested, it's a very rare case that they are interested. Some of them say, oh, we not already know enough about the visual system uh, and they don't look at some psychic effects that it could have. Uh, that's for the psychiatrist and because we have this separation of neuro neurologists and psychiatrists and uh, yeah some uh, look at it in a very analytical way mm. I personally have met only one neurologist here in Tyrol who had a session and the others well I, I don't go out to tell them hey i'm here i have a lamp that can induce epileptic seizures by flickering lights and so i stood away from this uh, approach and uh, so i stayed with it i, I don't go out and ask uh, neurologists to make this experience just recently a guy uh, uh, neuro ophthalmologist so with the eyes and the nerves um, he contacted me but uh, in the times of lockdown it's well, I have to take up this contact again maybe and there are also interesting uh, views on the use of psychedelic experiences by substances which could help in some uh, neuro ophthalmological uh, fields 
and especially we have the Schatz Bonnet syndrome. If someone uh, suffers from this, it could be interesting to go that way. But, uh, neurology, it's too spacey, I think, this thing with the lamp. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, thank you for sharing. Well, that's that's a wrap for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dirk, for being here. And we have a oh, thank you. Yes, and we have a Lucia Light community for anyone listening that wants to be part of it. And we're going to change the time of our meetings so that Dirk can join us um, because we see them in the evenings, and that's you know the middle of the night in Austria. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so if you want to stay in touch with Dirk, now and then. yeah, we'll reach out. Um, I'll be following up with a lot of great information after um, this little summit here and ways you can get involved with the community. And so, yeah, that's what we're all about. So thank you so much, Dirk. We really appreciate you. Thanks uh, for taking the time. I enjoyed it. And thank you for being here and asking all these interesting questions on our uh, I'm really looking forward for some follow up and I would stay up <laughs> also a little bit longer, but not <laughs> free in the morning. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> totally. oh, amazing. Okay, great. And then for everyone who's joining along here for the next um, ride, there's been a slight uh, change in the schedule. So the next uh, speaker will be Harrison. And then after that, there will be a little Q&A with Harrison and I, where you can really go deep with any other questions you might have about the Lucia and any panelists who are here who feel like joining that talk. You're also welcome um, to join and answer questions if you're available. And then uh, Michael will unfortunately not be able to join us today. So I will do hold the last session of the day, which will just be kind of closing thoughts and, you know, sharing a little bit more about ways that you can get involved in the community as really that's the intention, one of the big intentions for this whole summit is for us to kind of to connect and to be able to share and ask each other questions and, and share our perspectives in ways that we hold space, you know, as someone noticed today, every practitioner holds space in a different way. And um, yeah, that's what we're all about is learning from each other to develop our own way to hold space. So as Dirk mentioned, that we can connect, you know, heart to heart with who we're working with. And that's what's more important than anything they're bringing in terms of imbalance or challenges in their lives. It's how much we can connect with them and create that safe space for them to go deep within themselves, do the work within themselves and show up in a in a clearer, brighter way and connect to that infinite light that's always available. So, whew, so exciting. All right. Thank you, Dirk. <laughs> Lots of love to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for love the great you time. all. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Yeah.